So now we move to another, to the first debate that is about uh, the, um, the volume of activity in the lung transplant center and if, if, if this can, can affect uh, really on the outcomes and on, on the result. We have um, representing a, a high volume center, Corrad uh, uh, Erznecker from Vienna. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, introduction. I was asked to present the high volume part of this uh, uh, controversy, this uh, controversy discussion. And the title uh, I was given as Big is Beautiful. Uh, here are my disclosures. I have no disclosures, but uh, rather than that I work in a high volume center, of course, so I make a strong plea, of course, for high volume centers. This is our annual caseload, which has been above 100 cases for years now, and we overlook and uh, uh, experience of over 2,000 cases so far. So the time for Barbie dolls is definitely over, if you ask me, and I will convince you uh, during the next uh, couple of uh, minutes that Big is the, actually the new beautiful here, and uh, uh, Dr. Petrami will have a hard time to conquer this. Uh, what is a high volume center? So let's talk about definitions first. High volume is uh, not strictly defined in the literature. However, if we look at ISHLT data, uh, centers are consistently doing above 50 cases per year over a time period of 15 years are limited to 15 centers uh, worldwide. Um, in the literature, high volume centers are, uh, are frequently uh, defined as 30 cases or more, or more per year. Uh, so how it all began when talking about volume center effect and it took me quite some time to go back and find the first publication. This was very interesting for me uh, to learn. Uh, this was uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine back 1979. And the hypothesis of this Stanford group was at that time that they found from the industry that there was an experience curve uh, in terms of unit costs and production time uh, in the airplane and automobile industry where they could see that those costs and unit time decreased with a higher experience and a higher caseload. Uh, so what the hypothesis was whether this would also be the case in, uh, in surgery. And they uh, looked at uh, a huge cohort of patients, over eight, eight, 800,000 patients, grouped them into 12 surgical procedures, included 150 hospitals, and came up uh, with uh, the conclusion that for complex surgical procedures, such as open heart surgery, vascular surgery, hip replacement, there is a profound uh, volume center effect. But this is not true for easy cases, just as cholecystectomy or uncomplicated appendectomy. Uh, based on this first publication, 1979, uh, here come uh, the publication from the uh, Transplant Medicine Heart, uh, where the first one describing a, a volume center effect in 1994, liver transplantation, also New England Shelf Medicine paper, 1999, continued kidney transplantation, 1999, pancreas transplantation, 2004. So you might ask, what about lung? Lung, the first uh, publication on lung transplantation uh, describing a central volume effect was not done before 2009. But this was a, a large study on the other side looking at UNOS data of over 10,000 cases including 80 centers and they found that of course there is a profound central volume effect and if you look the survival curves clearly separate. The limitation of this study was that uh, a high volume center was defined as doing 20 cases or more, which is definitely not the thing we would define as high volume today. However, 2016 update publication, again, the UNOS data set, and you can see that now high volume centers were defined as 40 cases or more per year, and again, the survival curve separate high volume centers doing better, having a better outcome. So I could actually stop my presentation here. But unlike some politics, uh, um, I would like uh, to uh, look below the surface and give you a, li give you a little in-depth analysis. And I, I uh, thought about how to do this, so I grouped the, the lung transplantation into three main components. The first one being patient selection, the second one surgery and perioperative uh, care, and then uh, the long-term follow-up. And I'll show you data for each of those components uh, stating that uh, uh, working in a high-volume center is better 
uh, than in a low volume center. What about patient selection? Uh, this is uh, critical, and if you look at uh, the publications uh, uh, that are out today, there's a profound difference in patient uh, 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 selection uh, uh, in uh, low volume versus high volume centers. This starts with the underlying diagnosis, low volume centers having a higher proportion of COPD patients in their uh, waiting list, uh, high volume centers doing, of course, the pH patient and complicated IPS. But there is a difference also in bridging. This is true for mechanical ventilation as bridging and ECLS as bridging. Uh, uh, high volume centers have a higher uh, proportion of uh, high last patient kind of um, underlining that uh, more complex patients are done in high volume centers. And then retransplantation is something which is much more frequently done in high volume centers, of course. So uh, uh, let's step one uh, uh, step back and uh, from, uh, from the theory and uh, go into the and practical examples. And I just pulled out two examples which I found interesting from our patient cohort, uh, which of course in terms of indication can be debatable, but uh, should show you that what high volume centers with their experience over the years can actually offer patients. This is a, 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 the story of a, um, a female a girl who is uh, meanwhile well known in our center. She received her first transplantation back uh, in 1995 when she was a small uh, CF girl and meanwhile was retransplanted three times. She gained 25 years of additional lifetime in very good quality and the picture on the right hand side uh, is her cycling yesterday. Second patient, probably even more controversial, six-year-old female child. Uh, in January 2019, uh, uh, um, um, underwent an influenza ARDS, went into septic shock due to bacterial superinfection, and had a very rough course thereafter. Uh, here you can see the first picture uh, with uh, uh, toes, uh, toes uh, getting black. She was resuscitated with a VA ECMO, changed to a VV, and then changed to a central ECMO combination, kind of survived this critical first period, stabilized from her sepsis, and was transferred to our transplant center with a picture like this. And against all odds, uh, we decided to transplant uh, this young girl. She received a bilobar transplantation, and is meanwhile out of the ICU doing fine. You can see her having a drink on the right side. She's on a normal ward. She can walk. Her uh, finger and toes have completely uh, recovered after a bridging period of 93 days on three different kind of ECMO components. So this is something you can do in high volume centers. But what about the second component, uh, perioperative treatment surgery? Let's start with ECLS bridging. There are two papers around showing that it matters whether you do ECLS bridging in a low volume center or you do it in a high volume center. Again, the survival curves uh, significantly differ between high and low volume centers. But it's not only the survival, uh, more importantly, how are patients bridged? And awake mobile bridging, something we all aim at the moment because this has a significant impact in the perioperative course of those patients, have been only exclusively reported by high volume centers. And this is so important for the patient to keep them awake, to keep them ambulating uh, until they receive their transplant. What about the surgery itself and complication rates? Um, let me just uh, draw your attention to the right hand side. Actually, there is no difference if you look at the main ma major complications between low volume and high volume centers. This is something I wouldn't have expected. I would have thought, you know, low volume centers, less experience, more complication. That's not true when looking at the literature. However, if a patient actually has a stroke, and then we have to look at the right hand side here, the survival rates is significantly better, the odds of surviving is better. And this is true for renal failure, this is true for stroke, true for reoperation, infection, and rejection. Uh, this is again data from uh, Vienna, and uh, I found this uh, very interesting, plotting the annual caseload on the x-axis and then looking at, uh, the, uh, at uh, the one year survival and you can see that with increasing number of transplant or one year survival significantly improved over the years. And on the other hand, the airway complication rates as a surrogate make marker for complications uh, decreased and we are now down to 1% of airway complication rates. 
Uh, this is uh, a nice publication from the Ohio State University. Don uh, Hayes kind of combined two different factors, ischemic time uh, and uh, 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 volume center effect. And uh, we've heard before that ischemic time of six, seven hours might be critical, but this is only true for the low volume center. This is a, quite a complex statistical evaluation, but if you uh, look at uh, the odds of uh, dying, uh, then the center, the low volume center have an increased hazard ratio for mortality, but this is not true for a high volume center. They can easily go up to nine hours, 10 hours cold ischemic time, and their patient do not have a higher mortality rate. What about long-term follow-up? Also, we have evidence for long-term follow-up. If you look at truncated survival analysis, and this has been recently published in the European Journal, uh, if you do a conditional one-year survival uh, and uh, look at uh, survival beyond this, you can see that high-volume centers offer a better long-term survival to their lung transplant patients than low-volume center. And this is mainly due to a decreased rate of infectious uh, deaths, uh, decreased rate of deaths for respiratory failure. The story continues. Transplantation is not transplantation anymore. We now go into detailed analysis. What about pH patients? What about CF patients? There is at least one publication in the CF population showing that if you get your transplantation in a, in a, in a center experienced with C CF, your outcome is actually much better. And this also has a significant impact in the, on, on economy and costs of the procedure. Of course, this is a publication from the US where costs are frequently monitored. And I found it interesting to learn that the same procedure, the standard lung transplantation in a low volume center is 13,000 US dollars more expensive than a lung transplantation in a high volume center. So yesterday evening, I kind of Googled what I could do with 13,000 US dollars, and I found that actually at the moment you can buy Jack Castle for 13,000 uh, euro. Uh, this is a recent article in the Bloomberg Business Week. Just transferring a patient from a low volume center to a high volume center. What about dedication? I think you will hear a lot about dedication uh, by Dr. Petrami, and uh, I mean, summarizing his talk up front. Um, looking at PubMed, I found zero hits if I searched for dedication and outcome in lung transplantation, so there is no evidence, whatever you will hear after me. Why? Because, of course, dedication is a prerequisite. We should, we should uh, put a maximal dedication to every patient, but this is independent of, uh, of course, the volume effect. It's just the surplus you have uh, when being transplanted in a high volume center. So in conclusion, healthcare providers, health politicians, they need to understand the importance of center volume. Uh, we uh, should consider changing to a volume-based uh, referral um, a concept, um, especially in the Eurotransplant region, there might be a need for reduction of the number of transplant uh, centers. Uh, and uh, for small countries in Europe, uh, the role of supranational system should be discussed. Thank you very much.